so just a Just a quick, uh, this, uh, uh, as mentioned earlier, I pre present Red Work Consultants. I'm a consulting engineer uh, with them. And uh, we essentially are majorly providing um, infrastructure eva evaluation uh, for the construction industry, right from geotechnical or pre-tendering stages all the way up to demolition stage. And uh, we have a, a big uh, enable laboratory in Kaloja, uh, MITC, any attending today are most welcome to have a um, look at the laboratory. We sort of have, uh, provide uh, underground ground as well as structural services and the material assessment center sort of serves as a meeting point for the geotechnical services as well as the structural services. Uh, <clears throat> starting with the presentation in itself, you know, uh, we when we look at the basics of concrete, uh, today what is concrete is very different from what it was about 25 years ago. And, uh, and more different from what it was about 50 years ago. So basics of concrete, concrete is a Latin word, uh, concretus, which essentially means um, to hold together or to grow together. And it, concrete is a formidable rock, really. It, you know, it's a very good quality rock. It's a com composite material, which is a binder and a filler. Concrete is one of the most used engineered material in the world. Um, and um, in terms of just material usage, per se, after water, concrete is the most uh, used material in the world. Um, so concrete production, concrete characteristics, uh, and ensuring the performance of concrete is a very important aspect. And we as civil engineers are involved in uh, using this material uh, and we need to do it uh, very correctly and thoroughly with the proper understanding of it. Now, typically in concrete, you have about uh, 11 to 12 percent or maybe 14 percent of cementitious materials. Um, if it's only normal concrete, typically about 11 percent of Portland cement, um, of about 40, uh, 40 to 42 percent of um, uh, crushed stone aggregates, what we call as M1 and M2 in India and about 25 to 28% of uh, fine aggregates, depending upon what uh, strength of concrete we are looking for, what is the uh, grade of concrete, that, uh, the workability of concrete that we are looking for. So given these proportions, um, it, you know, we will look at how uh, each some of these uh, ingredients affect the uh, con uh, concrete properties and how, what are the constant material properties that we need to keep track of uh, for designing of the concrete. Um, as civil engineers, um, we are we are working in three scales constantly. Um, uh, uh, like Mr. Uh, Mr. Jent uh, mentioned earlier, uh, that we are um, structural engineers are good in doing the structure, but actually they are using a material, uh, designing a structure. They are using a material whose be behavior at the micro level, at the micro scale determines how the design is going to be effective on a long-term basis. So as civil engineers, we have to be aware of the material behavior at the micro scale level, as well as a macro scale level, because as design engineers then go on to build it at a larger scale, having sort of this assumption that at micro scale, everything is good and uh, uh, great, and we can use this, uh, design it for a particular grade of concrete. And this is where the disconnect sort of ha uh, happens most of the times that we see where buildings um, uh, fail very early on or are not um, uh, uh, made properly. The, is typically the faults are in the construction um, aspects and not in the design aspects. And this is partly because we forget uh, that we need to look at the uh, macro scale. We look at, need to look at the micro scale also. And Quality control at site, you know, it's actually um, the structural engineers who hold a far better say and a stronger say in what and how the quality control should be at site than um, a, a project management consultant or the site engineer. So if uh, it's, it's very essential that structural engineers understand 
uh, what are the necessities um, that are there for concrete performance, what they need to uh, specify when they are designing the concrete and supplying the drawing, drawings um, to the site. Uh, because they actually, uh, the more conscious they are, the more aware they are of the material usage, of how to use it, uh, what is the extent of um, deviation that is acceptable at site, then there is more control on quality by the person who is at site. And this is specifically true for uh, smaller projects, larger infra projects these days, a lot of um, uh, them already have an in-house quality control system. But you, when you're dealing with uh, medium, uh, medium uh, builders or medium scale projects, where there is not necessarily a, um, a proper quality control department or quality control engineers, the structural engineers are able to have a major control on the quality control and are able to specify what kind of concrete that they should be adopting at site. <clears throat> so concrete, you know, as a larger, like I mentioned earlier, it's a mixture. It's, it's like making cake. Um, you, you know, when you're making cake, you have to have everything in perfect um, quantities. Uh, the, and uh, so making cake is a little unlike um, uh, making some of the Indian uh, savories, you know, where you you're sort of just pushing, uh, putting in some maybe uh, one bowl of something, half a bowl. We just sort of measure a little bit and throw it in, and uh, you are able to get the uh, Indian sweets made. But it is not so much in when in when you try and make a cake, you have to have perfect proportions when you are baking a cake. For those who may not have may not have tried so far how to bake a cake, maybe you could go and try that. And you'll understand that uh, designing concrete, making concrete is also very similar to like making a cake because the proportions need to be fixed and you need to ensure that there is a good quality control on the proportions right from the time when we are choosing it all the way to the time of the placement of the concrete. And as much as we are able to uh, have a good control over it, understand where the control needs to be put in, that much better designed uh, uh, buildings that much better designed infrastructure, um, sustainable infrastructure can be built um, uh, in, by in the same way. So uh, typically concrete, you're having cement, water, fine and coarse aggregate, but today we're using a lot of mineral admixtures or what is called a supplementary um, uh, cementitious uh, materials. And we also use a lot of different types of uh, chemical admixture, which are either super plasticizers, uh, which are polycarboxylates and other types, um, accelerators um, and uh, corrosion inhibitors, different types of chemical admixtures that typically get added um, to the concrete mi uh, mixture proportions. So <clears throat> making good concrete typically involves ensuring that we have good quality raw materials, uh, we are ensure, uh, ensuring that we are having a proper proportioning of materials. Uh, how, what is the mixing being used? Are we doing it at site or are we doing it at a proper RMC plant where there's a proper mixing uh, system available? Um, is there a, what is the distance of travel, transporting, how, is it, how it is being transported at site? Or, uh, what kind of methods are being adopted for uh, transportation? What are the methods adopted for placing, compaction, and the curing uh, adopted at the end? All of these make a difference and, uh, and help in creating good concrete. Especially the last uh, five are important from the designing perspective also. How, what are the proportions of materials we would use also depend upon what kind of mixing systems are we adopting? What are the placing systems are we adopting? That also define the proportioning of the materials. So the requirements of a good concrete then is to be mixed, transported, and compacted as efficiently as possible with minimum energy requirements and meet the strength requirements in terms of compressive strength and flexural strength. Fulfill durability requirements to resist the environment in which the structure is expected to serve and be as economical possible. And economics is, at the end of the day, always governs if a mixed proportion is good or not. Now, most times we are typically looking at the immediate economics of it. How much amount of cement we have been able to save, um, how much amount of chemical admixture we have been able to save, which are typically the expensive aspect um, in the concrete mix design today. But we also, at the same time, all need to see 
how, how was the concrete going to perform? What are the durability uh, aspects of it? Because as much as we might try to be able to save five or 10 rupees behind a mix today, we might be ending up spending more money in maintaining the structure. So the quality versus uh, economics is a, a very tricky um, uh, uh, game to follow. And we need to ensure that we are able to serve on both ends of it. Now, the, the relative qualities that define the economy, again, is the placeability, the consistency, the mechanical performance, and the uh, durability. Now, the durability and the mechanical performance, and the, thereby the economy, not on the application. So what is the, uh, you know, are we, are we needing a, a pumpable concrete, or are we uh, needing a concrete which the, uh, is going to be only moved in a, in a uh, normal uh, lift and being poured? What are the, ty the type of materials available? Are they good quality materials? Sometimes, many a times, the aggregates, especially the uh, fine aggregates available, are not necessarily of good quality. They have a higher amount of silt content, higher amount of clay content, which absorb a lot of water, which create a lot of issues in terms of uh, pumping. So these also aspects are going to be def uh, def defining the economy, are going to be defining the mixture design. So the cost then is depending upon the materials, the labor, the equipment, and the profit that we want from the mixed design. Typically, the labor and the equipment is fairly fixed. So it's the materials that are going to decide the economy of this. Now, if you want to minimize cement, we want to ensure that we're optimizing the aggregate content. We're in, we want to ensure that we're selecting an appropriate admixture. And we're trying to add supplemental cements um, or supplementary cementation materials like fly ash or um, slag or um, silica fume to it. Now see the degree of the quality control that we can have at a site and the risk typically associated with it, it depends upon um, a lot of different factors. Sometimes, most of the times what we see is that for, from the structural engineer's perspective, they think that it's cheaper to over-design than to take the risk or redesign it. So taking the risk is essentially saying that maybe the mix uh, doesn't need any more than 350 kg per uh, meter cube of cement, but we end up saying uh, no, minimum cement has to be 370 or 375, partly because uh, we don't want to take the risk, or we know that the quality at site may not be able to be, uh, we don't know what is the quality of site, or we don't know what quality uh, aspects we need to ensure um, at site to uh, be able to reduce the cement content. So some of these are having the knowledge of what the mix design should be and uh, what are the, uh, and appreciating the uh, characteristics of the material. What we're able to do is ensure that we have a higher degree of quality control, reduce the risk and thereby economize on the uh, total structure cost itself. Now, what happens in the quality of concrete is that you have different materials that we're using. And this we have not shown the supplementary cementation materials or cement, uh, but obviously that also affects the quality of concrete, but in a different way, and I'll come to that in a bit. But the materials in quality concrete, which affect the quality are going to typically the materials in terms of water, aggregate in the admixtures, the placement and the mixing. Now, water, of as everybody knows and is very much aware, the quantity of water that is being utilized makes a huge difference in the um, quality of the mix. Um, the aggregate, in aggregate, the gradation, the volume, the impurities that might be present in it, uh, the moisture content, the uh, uh, water absorption abilities, all these aspects affect the quality of the concrete. And what we have, I have typically observed um, that when we are doing, our laboratory is doing mixed designs, is that um, uh, the, the contractors or the, because the um, structural engineers are not aware of the things, contractors do not want to indulge in doing the material characterizations and only want to do a, immediately jump into doing a mixed design. What happens is this is, 
essentially that about having an over design so this is what i mentioned earlier in the slide over here that degree of quality control and the risk it may be cheaper to over design and this is what happens most of the times in many or even in the um, you know lower strength when i mean when i say lower strength i'm looking saying at between m25 m30 m35 that we end up utilizing more cement partly because we don't we are wanting to over design because we are we are not sure of what the quality control is or that uh, that uh, the contractors want to save on a few thousand rupees by not indulging in material characterization and jumping straight away into uh, the mixed design aspect of it because if we are able to do the gradation if we are able to understand what is the specific gravity what is the um, uh, water absorption ability of the aggregates uh, precisely prior to uh, doing the mixture proportioning doing the characterization and then doing the mixture proportioning it helps in saving the cement amount and it helps in getting a far more durable concrete um the same way in admixtures um especially if we are, there is a site mix and not an rmc mix then the addition time makes a difference or even sorry let me correct that even in for rmc mixes um the time of addition of the admixtures make a difference um is partially added at the site and partially added during the mixing time itself you are able we are able to save on the amount of admixtures that is being utilized we are able to save um <clears throat> uh, some amount of uh, time also by adding admixtures and utilizing the mix again so some of these aspects become important uh characterization aspects become important in designing the concrete because they are the links in the quality of the um the timing on uh, the hall the distance uh, that that uh, to move and the temperature of the time of placing all of this again also uh, affect the quality of the concrete one of the most important things uh, that we have seen uh, gets uh, sort of um, respected enough or sort of just used as some you know uh, many uh, that there is a a uh, large amount of uh, information already available so the moisture content or the uh, specific gravity of a particular of a particular area is assumed whereas there is a lot of variability that happens um, in the aggregate and this variability then affects in how much amount is being used utilized in uh, uh, in the mix so if you when we decide on what is the specific gravity of the soil what is the amount of water that is being absorbed by the aggregate during the mixing process makes a difference to how much amount of water can be added many times because larger amount of water is added either there's a loss of strength and because there might be a good, the, the prediction that there is going to be a loss of strength we are adding more cement to, uh, into the mix in, from the beginning itself so again the cost uh, where the cost can be optimized um uh, typically we end up not being able to optimize because we are skipping some of the initial characterization that should be done uh, before the start of the uh, of the concreting process now typically uh, we also need to do um uh, what is the moisture content of the aggregates on a daily basis especially now during the rainy season uh, the moisture content of the aggregates uh, should be done at um, the rmc plant or if it is at site then uh, at site too before uh, starting the uh, concrete production <coughs> now the uh, concrete mix design is basically a concept of particle packing where you have um, you know if you can imagine um, a, a a box of 1 meter by 1 meter by 1 meter in which we have some um, large size balls like footballs and then you have some uh, small size balls let's say cricket uh, cricket balls and then you have smaller size balls which are let's say the uh, table tennis balls and then you have um, the marbles what you call in marathi as goti so imagine a box that is filled um with all these different uh, sizes of balls and the idea would be to ensure that there is no um empty space left that there is no 
um, uh, blank or open space left in that box and the box is completely filled up with these bo uh, balls of different sizes. So mixed design is essentially very similar to that. What we're trying to do is that we're using um, large size aggregates, we're using medium size aggregates, then fine aggregates, and a lot of different cementitious materials, um, or just maybe Portland cement. And the benefit of using uh, cementitious materials compared to just using Portland cement is essentially that we're able to get a better part, uh, particle packing within that box. So if you see over here, the uh, fly ash, the silica plume is far, far more finer than cement. And which means that we are getting a very well-packed, well-densely uh, packed system um, when we do the mixed proportioning. And when the mixed proportioning is done properly uh, by doing proper characterization right in the beginning, we get as much better uh, densely packed model as possible and reducing the amount of pores that are going to be left behind. Because what happens is once the concrete is hardened, these pores then become a headache for us. These pores are the um, um, are the pathways for uh, water ingress, are the pathways for chemical ingress, um, in leading to uh, the <clears throat> um, leading to the corrosion of the reinforcement, leading to the de deterioration of the concrete. So, right in the beginning, if we do material characterization properly, if we do a sieve analysis of the aggregate, ensure that we have proper, we get a proper good S curves and those gradations are able to uh, <clears throat> reduce or increase the amount of aggregates based on these material characterizations, then we are able to get a compact system right from the beginning itself. Uh, the other <clears throat> material uh, that creates a lot of problems uh, in concrete is water. And, um, Many a times, uh, proper water is not utilized in ma uh, concrete making. Typically, what is proper water or construction water that we are, uh, the IS defines is really actually just drinkable water. If water is drinkable, then it's usable in concrete. And But the amount of water that would be utilized in the concrete is influenced by a couple of different things. Firstly, it is influenced by the aggregate, the size and the shape of the aggregates. If we have aggregate um, the sizes which are larger, more larger, we might need a larger amount of uh, water to ensure that the uh, concrete is flowable. And this is why then when we when we see concretes which are pumpable, which are have a slump, which are in the pumpable so regions, uh, that is slump flow in terms of 150, 200 or more, um, typically the size of the aggregates is reduced. And the primary uh, two main reasons why size of aggregates is reduced in such cases is because we are unable, we would end up having to use more water. We'd also end up having a pumpability issues because the aggregates will not roll onto each other and be able to move quickly. So the size, shape, and grading of aggregates definitely decide of how much amount of water we are ending up using in the mixed design. And again, then this goes to the strength aspect. If we are able to curb the amount of water that's going to be used in the mixed design right from the beginning, we are able to get a good quality concrete, a good performing concrete, as well as good strength. So typically an M25, M30 could be made somewhere between 300 or 310, 325 also, if we are able to maintain a good quality right from the beginning. Uh, <clears throat> then the amount of chemical admixtures used and the quality of the, uh, of the chemical admixtures used. If you use high-end chemical admixtures, uh, <clears throat> then we, we, we can reduce that is being used. And of, of course, the placement needs, is it pumpable or is it just uh, you know, being um, taken by a, a wheelbarrow and uh, poured into the uh, uh, forms that would define what kind of uh, amount of water would be required for the mix. So, Typically, what happens when we use different types of um, supplementary cementitious materials that we are today using, we're using fly ash, we're using silica fume, um, we're using slag. Um, each material works in different ways. And when we try to use these different materials, or even let's say if we use fibers, 
um, each material addition of fibers is going to change how, what is the workability of the uh, uh, concrete mix. Fly ash typically is able to reduce the water demand. What that means is that we are able to reduce the uh, amount of water that will be used in the mix. Um, silica fume typically tends to increase the water demand and to, uh, when there, whenever silica fume is used, you would need to use high-end admixtures for, uh, for the purpose. Uh, so fly ash tends to improve the workability. Silica fume, because it's a little sticky mix, tends to reduce the uh, workability. And so that is why when we're using M40, M50, M60 grades of concrete with uh, using silica fume, we also add some amount of fly ash or slag, make it a ternary mix, primarily from the workability perspective and the water demand perspective, because the, we, are, the, we are able to control the workability and the water demand of the mix, which is getting uh, going higher up due to silica fume. So we are balancing out the negative effects of silica fume by using uh, fly ash. Bleeding typically almost all supplementary cementitious materials uh, reduce the amount of bleeding that happens in concrete. Setting time uh, for fly ash concretes typically gets uh, uh, increased a little bit. Also fly ash concretes, purely fly ash concretes um, tend to have uh, low early age strengths, but the strengths improve uh, after 28 days, at 28 days and after 28 days. Heat of hydration, um, fly ash typically reduces heat of hydration, even slag usage reduces heat of hydration. Silica fume does not change the uh, amount of heat of hydration that would be given out by the concrete. So like I mentioned earlier, fly ash, the early strength gain is typically on the lower side, especially if you have a, a, a fly ashes which are uh, having a, a lesser SiO2 and more calcium oxide, which will tend to um, react later. Silica fume will always give you high early strengths. Slag, again, depends upon the chemical composition that's being utilized. Um, uh, if it might uh, increase the early strength or it might decrease the early strength. Long term, all cement supplementary cementation materials will always improve or increase the long term strengths. Permeability, water permeability, oxygen permeability, uh, uh, chloride in plus, all of these will typically get reduced uh, uh, or that is the improvement will happen um, in all of these parameters. Even sulfate, sulfate resistance, there'll be an improvement in, these, uh, in the resistance to power sulfate uh, because of usage of uh, supplementary cementitious materials. So in, in essentially when we're doing mixture proportioning, the aspect is that we have to look at the long-term requirements in terms of strength, the durability and the volume stability versus the short-term requirements, which is the workability, finishability and permeability. And both these, this uh, seesaw is typically different by um, what type of SCMs we are using, how much amount of water we are using, and what is the quality of sand we are using. Because if you are able to use good quality sand, if you are able to use some amount of supplementary supplements and reduce the water, then typically the uh, left side, the strength, durability, and volume stability gets taken care of automatically by ensuring that the quality is maintained at the workability end, at the finishability end in itself. Um, I had got a question in the morning in regards to the aspects of trend, because essentially the mixed proportioning is um, about uh, defining the strength in itself. And like I mentioned in the beginning, I'm not going into how to do the mixture proportioning in itself, because it's not a one hour job, it will take a lot of time. But I'm going to touch upon some of the main aspects of it, especially as a structural engineer, as a specifier, and then ensuring that the specified concrete is being delivered, the specified uh, uh, strengths are achieved or not. I'm going to touch a uh, base because of that. I'm touching base upon the aspect of compressive strength. So, <clears throat> as we know, the <clears throat> mixture proportion is defined from two. The water cement ratio and the strength, the 28 day strength is defined. Now, when we are doing the first, the mix design in itself, the tube compressive strengths um, that have to be achieved at the end of 28 days uh, is called as F prime um, uh, CR or the required compressive strength. 
and F prime CK, which is with the specified compressive strength. And where S is the uh, standard deviation that would be acceptable for a given strength of boundary. And IS defines what that value of S should be. So typically what we then as uh, structural engineers or at site engineers have to ensure that at site, the F prime C, let's say if it is an M30 grade of concrete, the F prime C is not M30. Um, um, are you able to see my, uh, my pointer? It's okay. Hello? No. Uh, yes. Yeah, we can see. Yeah, we can see. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah. F prime C is, you know, uh, so uh, in the bell curve, F prime C uh, is the specified uh, compressive strength, which is actually at the uh, left end. And left end is the most minimal value that should be achieved by the concrete. So F prime C is the most minimal value that should be achieved by the concrete at site, which is, um, let's say, M30 in for an example. So this is, this is where we are. But when we are designing the mills, we are designing for this 95% acceptability or the highest um, peak in this uh, bell-shaped curve. So this F prime CR will be typically at least three to eight MPA higher than F prime C. So when you get the test mix design report, the, uh, this should be that your F prime, C, uh, F prime CR, the requirement value, is always in this higher end, which includes the standard deviation of it, and it's higher than F prime C, which is the specified strength uh, of the pump. And F prime C always is based on 28 days. And this is a biggest um, issue, uh, issue, an issue that happens many a times, that um, the builder or the uh, structural engineer, they want to <coughs> start for their casting. And it can, uh, we can understand from the economic sense. But when you test uh, uh, the concrete at seven days, or if you test it at four, you cannot expect the concrete, first of all, to achieve this F prime C value. You cannot accept it to be along this red line. It will be somewhere much on the left side than on the right side of this bell curve. And, um, you cannot expect that you cannot, whatever value, so even if you understand that, yes, it's going to be less than F prime C, it's going to be less than M30 if it, uh, it is being tested at seven days or 14 days. The IS does not say that 67% um, or 70% of um, the design is acceptable. The IS456 does not say that. The special publication does say it, but from a testing perspective, from a quality control perspective, where we are following 456 um, and 456 and 516 is the mandate uh, in quality control, F prime C uh, has to be what the designed mix has to be, uh, strength has to be. And that will be at 28 days only. It cannot be at seven days or it cannot be made acceptable at seven days or 14 days. If you want to take that risk, that risk is being taken at the engineer's level or at the developer's level. But it is not uh, It is not by the rule book, if you go to see, it's not necessarily the right thing per se. So it depends upon the quality that you are confident of at site that you can take a risk, but that is, it is not the actual 28 day strength. And this is a mistake that many a times I've seen at site that happen where they feel that somehow this thumb rule that we have adopted at site is an actual rule, but it's not. It's a thumb rule, just a very general thumb rule. And many a times people also forget that this thumb rule was developed in the 80s, which was when 43 grade cement was used. In the 90s also, when 43 grade cement was used. And 43 grade cement are different from 50. And today, in fact, mostly PPC cements are being used. OPC pure uh, ordinary Portland cement are not necessarily used. So when you have so much of jump in the characteristics of the cements that are being utilized by RMC manufacturers, you are available at the market. 
sort of blindly going along with the thumb rule, which has come from ages, and continuing to utilize it as the correct as a as the correct aspect is wrong. It's a norm. It will also depend upon how much um, how much uh, faith you have on the quality control that is being done at site. How much quality control you're able to actually have a control on things that will depend on that. <clears throat> So as, uh, you know, going into very specifics of what is an acceptable acceptance criteria for um, compressive strengths, very simple test uh, <clears throat> that every engineer should know how, because the compressive strength test and the SLAM test are like the doctor's stethoscope and the blood pressure equipment. So I feel that every engineer, be it a geotechnical, be it a structural, be it an estimation, whatever type of engineer today, given that uh, projects are so vast, we have so many different um, engineers uh, that labels that are uh, there. We all should know, just as the uh, doctors know, how to take a heartbeat using a stethoscope or how to measure the blood pressure using their blood pressure equipment. We should know how to measure the slump or how to measure the slump flow. And we should know how to quantify the compressive strength based on our three cubes. This is something which should, which, which should be sort of very well ingrained in our mind so that even if you get up from your sleep, you are able to tell that. And I always say, that especially for the younger engineers uh, who are only doing designing or who are only doing one aspect of the engineering, but this is some. This is like the lifeline for a uh, for the uh, for our structures, and we should be able to be define it with proper fundamental understanding of things. So coming now to you know uh, sort of going into the specifics, we cast three cubes, and typically we either test them at seven days and twenty eight days, or seven, fourteen, and twenty eight days. Um, like I mentioned earlier, seven and fourteen does not have this acceptability criteria as per the IS uh, in itself. Now, also when we test the cubes, we typically are testing three samples, always not two or not one, because that is what is, from, for to get the bell curve that I showed earlier, we need to have three samples to be done. For one, um, one, uh, for one truck, let's say, or one uh, five cubic uh, meters of concrete. Now, once these cubes are tested, or the IS-456, sorry, IS-516 um, uh, says is that all three should be considered for average. So we take an average, we find the average based on the three values that are uh, for available to us. Once we find the average, if that average within the requirement that is being specified in the mixer proportion, then for 28 days, the report becomes acceptable. And that is what you see over here. If the average is less than the requirement, maybe the requirement in this report was M20. I do not know right now. I've just pulled up one of the reports that we had. And because it's less than M20 or maybe M25, we have said that the concrete is not acceptable. Now, over here in this note, you will, you will see that there's a note over here which says serial number one, two, and three are considered for average. Why is this being specifically spe uh, mentioned here? Is because what I asked for uh, 516 says is that once we take the average, where you find the average of these three groups, then we recheck the values. Each of these values has to be within 0 0.85 of the um, FCK on 1.15 of the FCK. So if we see this, um, this is probably M25 grade of concrete specified, being specified at site, and these all are about more than uh, M25, but they're well within 1.15. So we have to do that calculation and check up if these cubes would be between 0 0.85 of FCK to 1.15 of FCK. And if they are not, then we remove that particular result, which is not within that criteria, and we do re-average it. So here's one report, which probably the uh, specified strength was M45. And there is 
once when they did the average, the 36.22 obviously was way off from AM45. So we only consider these two, which is within the 1.15 times of F prime C and get the average compressive strength for us. This is something which is very important, which a lot of uh, engineers um, uh, need to understand when they are not only specifying, but also trying ensuring that quality is being maintained at site as to how to uh, calculate the strength and how which report will be acceptable and which will not be acceptable. <coughs> so typically, uh, you know, the uh, problems that are uh, occurring at site, we, we might want to have a very a perfect system, but it's not possible to have a perfect system. So the, typically the major issues that arrive at site are that the truck arrives late. Um, it, might, it might be more than the amount of time the admixtures are able to work and some kind of setting might have started or some amount of slump loss might have started. Temperature, there's a huge variation uh, in temperature or daytime temperatures are very high. Um, in process, problem makes design itself, that is maybe that day it has rained very heavily and uh, the moisture content uh, test was not carried out. Um, there could be a delayed curing and um, a shrinkage happening because of some of these initial three, um, uh, three things, which is temperature or in problem makes design or delayed curing, resulting in shrinkage sort of happening at site. And typically these, while our site, site and placement issues, some we get I get a questions many a times that if the truck arrives at later site, can we add water to it? And typically, no, you cannot add water to it. You may add some admixture and remix it vigorously for a couple of minutes and check up the slump again. And if the slump is within the requirements or specifications, maybe you could utilize it. But otherwise, it's very uh, it's not very advisable to utilize a truck which is come in late, where there's a slump loss of more than. 30 to 50 mm, um, because by then, what would have happened is that some amount of cement hydration would have started and initial setting of the concrete would have started. Uh, one of the questions that came to me, though this is not something that uh, I would say again, you know, that should, is a, rule, uh, is a rule in itself. This is not from the rule book. This is just based upon experience and sort of a thumb rule thing where Hamid cement uh, content versus vis-a-vis -vis the grade of concrete is acceptable. I've tried to draw up for this, where I said M15 is between 250 to 300, um, M25 is 310 to 360, M30 is 340 to 390. Now these ranges are again also gonna depend upon what is the um, type of aggregate that's being used of the aggregate, uh, what are the uh, pumpability uh, requirements at site. But so, uh, broadly speaking, these ranges could be uh, uh, remembered uh, and, kept, uh, and kept in mind or kept on the table when you're specifying um, the kind of uh, amount of mix uh, cement that is acceptable uh, in the mixed proportion. So these were the, some of the questions that I had received and I've tried to, uh, you know, go through uh, most of these as much as possible. Um, if there are any more questions, then I think I'll open up uh, now. For I request everybody to put their questions in question and answer uh, box. We have uh, right now only one question from Sarsh. How too much content? How how too much content of fines does leads to reduction in strength of concrete? Can you repeat the question, please? How too much content of fines okay. does leads to reduction in strength of concrete? First, first you have to define what is fines. Which fines is needed? Yeah, because uh, I don't see fines, too much fines necessarily reducing uh, may, uh, the strength per se. Uh, specifically, if the cement has been specified, um, uh, Excuse me. Yes, go ahead. We ask him whether he is referring to fines of the sand or fine cementitious material like silica film is a very fine material. Ply ash is a very fine material which is useful you for it. Fines of sand. sand. But now if it is fines of sand, then it is a different matter. 
sand only. This is uh, referring to fines of sand only, not fines uh, related to cementation. Yeah. Uh, very, uh, very rough thumb rule will be one percent fines. Extra fine will increase or uh, decrease the strain by two percent. Yes, yes, yes. The fines, the less than hundred fifty microns, less than seventy five microns, um, will uh, uh, in, you know have a uh, this on the strain. It'll primarily reduce hey, what, what he's asking is he uh, that it will reduce is okay but what is the uh, uh, phenomena behind it how why why it is like that so, well go ahead go ahead yes yes ma'am no the phenomena i think primarily is not that the reduction is happening because of the fines in that sense that you know uh, they are somehow uh, inhibiting the cement to hydrate or something like that, uh, because, like I mentioned, you know, uh, essentially mixture proportion is a, is about packing packing part for packing. packing density. And uh, in fact, if you have more fines, then it, it is okay because they get uh, filled up. But what happens at site with the fines is the uh, water that is consumed by the fines in itself. So the water which should be there for the cement to hydrate is now not any longer available for the cement and is being sucked in by the um, uh, pour, uh, by the fines and sort of is you know again it gets evaporated or it uh, it, uh, it's not it's not being utilized from the correct perspective and then that, that also the presence of fines are going to create issues in your uh, workability it's creating issues in pumpability and which creates weak zones in the concrete reducing the strength so it's not necessarily reducing the strength you know uh, directly uh, from uh, from a calculation based perspective but more from the um, site issues that is get raised because of higher amount of site fines yeah. can you slightly add to this yes sir uh, more and less fines is with respect to mixed design it is possible to design a mix with higher uh, uh, fines content. Suppose the sand has 15% fines. You can still design a mix. Yeah. So it will be uneconomical. But you can still design M30 for that with higher uh, workability, with higher cementitious material. But if the mix is designed with 15% fines, the problem will be if the fines in the actual concrete is 5% or 25%. So if it is less than 15%, this is also going to create problem. If it is more than 15%, it is 20%, it is going to create a problem. So, fine, uh, what should be the fines in concrete? It should be equivalent to roughly plus minus 1.5%, 2% of what is there in the mixed design. So, that should be remembered. There is uh, one more question. What is the IS and SCI limit for maximum flyage content, which is more suitable in your? Uh, I think ISI has limited to 30 uh, percent, but it is depending upon the grade of the concrete, if I'm not mistaken, I don't have, uh, you know, remember it right away. Um, it, is, it, is, it is limited to 30 percent as a cementitious material. Yeah, yeah. As a cementitious material has been... If you are thinking of cement replacement, as a cementitious material is 30%. You can have a concrete field with more than 30% fly ash, but this extra fly ash is going to act as fines, which will increase the water demand and, and other effects. It will act only as a aggregate, fine aggregate. It will not take part into uh, hydration because, uh, because there is a carbon, uh, carbon hydroxide, uh, sorry, calcium hydroxide is uh, limited in the concrete volume. So, hydration will take place only to the limit calcium hydroxide is available. Beyond that, it will it will simply inert material. Yeah, true, correct. 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 Yeah, I don't think there are any more questions. So, uh, I think but we uh, will also only discuss, uh, I like to discuss the issues when people, when their mixed design comes from RMC, most of the times. Okay. So nowadays it is computerized mixed design, so there is no question of any calculation mistakes and all such things. But most of the places, what they are doing is only they are just uh, uh, assuming some uh, contents and uh, adding them and uh, showing the particle packing. That's all. 
it is yes, that's yes, all they are saying so the no that material that characterization is given nothing is given so that is why i said that uh, yeah, okay. the as a structural engineer you, yeah. know, you are first approving the mix design yeah um, uh, it uh, you should demand a proper demand correct in itself because that also that gives an idea if cement could be reduced or not mm. or reduced or not or what is what are the different what are the different quality uh, controls you would need to also utilize at site because what happens is once the concrete uh, arrives on site then you are uh, uh, understanding how it is behaving and then you are um, uh, you know sort of uh, doing plus minus or this in the quality control the, uh, that is being followed would be followed at site so if the characterization is done beforehand um, a better control over the uh, mix design happens and a better control yeah. Scientists. So, no, madam, problem is uh, at RMC since it is a established process, they do that. Only thing is, we don't know for what material it is done, and actually what material is going. Yeah, so, so that, that is the main issue. Huh? But public as a designer, because hmm? as a designer, hmm? I don't think you should go much beyond uh, what is required as a designer. No, that's so, true. That's true. But, 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 but still. Yeah. Still, the mix designs are coming for approval. Yeah. <laughs> very defined for approval. Now, when it is going coming to a designer for approval, there are certain things the designer must be uh, careful. Mm. The exposure condition, whether the mix has been designed for the exp exposure condition which has been specified by the designer. Second thing is maximum size aggregate. Whether the maximum size aggregate is good enough for the type of congestion of reinforcement to have a proper concreting. The MSA, whether it should be 10, 10 mm, not 20 mm for a given uh, structure. So, that is the second point which can be seen. Third point is that sometimes the people for cheaper and economic concrete, they provide a lesser slump at the design stage, whereas higher slump is required uh, in the field. And that is done by adding water in the field. So, that kind of chalaki uh, should, should be seen by this design has been some whether the proper slump has been considered for this design. Third is that whether, whether secondary cementitious material has been added and whether it, this is going to detrimental for uh, deshuttering or for long span, this thing or for self weight or something. I mean, so whatever is any uh, design uh, criteria for uh, strength gain, speed of gain of strength. Because IS code has given certain deshuttering time. And that deshuttering time is considering certain standard rate of gain of strength. Whether that mix design is following that standard rate of gain of strength. If it is not, then a caution will have to be given for dishes. So this is what uh, another problem which I found, though I am not a designer, but I found many times the mix is given with just one set of cube, 128 result, and approval is sought for. Now, you cannot approve a mix design with just one set, 128 uh, the cube result. The code says minimum three sets should be there. But if it is coming from RMC, then you can ask for a standard deviation for the previous month for the same grade. And that standard deviation will be a very good indicator. One single uh, 28 cube is not the proper indicator for a code. So this is one aspect which needs to be understood by designer. By so these are the few key points which came to my mind. Yes. <laughs> Madam, you have want, uh, want to add anything in this because these are imp important from points from structural engineers' point of view. Hey, I will add one more question, Pandey ji. Ha, Pandey. Ha, bolre ki one cube is not acceptable, but I learned that especially for the me mechanized concrete producer, they have. Uh, the, the condition relaxed from three to two or three to one. Is it like that? That you or madam can tell. Me. Two cube. There is average three cube is one sample. Ah, correct. I'm talking about one sample. Approving any mix design based on only one sample. Moving sample. statistical analysis. It is called as moving statistical analysis. Mm -hmm. Average. Now, are typically are doing uh, many many cubic meters of concrete every day. Uh, they would be uh, casting accordingly that many number of samples. Typically, probably an RMC would cast anywhere between uh, 
let's say seven to ten cube uh, sets of cubes every day, at least a minimum. And so what mm. that means is that for that grade of concrete, for the this they would have a moving average. But um, he says that you need to get the statistical analysis. Uh, I think they should give that, but no, no, normally what, what they, they have a standard uh, format and that they give with some 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 earlier uh, trial mix and that's all. <laughs> okay. But I, they can. Obviously, I mean to say, you see, the RC people they give based on their earlier running mix, and they give one twenty. So RC person may be doing well. He must be knowing his standard deviation. He must be knowing the training. Okay, okay. You as a designer, when you are getting one document and without knowing the past, so oh. if the same mix design, the same file mix should have three sets of cube and three results. And based on those three results, only you can uh, you can pass yeah, a basically um, nine sets, nine cubes. Uh, nine cubes, three sets, nine three sets. Yeah. And if three sets are not yeah. available, yeah. So yeah. you can ask for a standard deviation for the past at least thirty results from the same RMC for the same grade. If you get that thirty results standard deviation, and if it is within limits, then one single cube can also be one single set can also be accepted, but not in absence of history. So there is one, and what sir is saying that yes, one sample we consider average of three, but in RMC plants average of two is taken as one sample. That is what sir is asking. Oh, correct. Three. And this has become a standard norm in most of the RMC. Yes. But when you have to define a concrete as M30 or M40. Then there is no compromise. It has got to be three sets. <coughs> you have to it have must three, three. Yeah, three definitely. Two cubes, two cubes cannot be acceptable. It has to be three cubes. At least, if not three sets that you are asking for. One more uh, uh, question is there: How mass concrete pore factor is considered in concrete mixed design? I don't know how how what is meant by mass concrete pore factor. He has not given the name. I don't know. Miss, maybe anything special we want to do a uh, talk about mass mass concrete mix design. Mass concrete, you have to consider the temperature rise. Yeah, yeah. Temperature. And there is a formula. <coughs> of temperature rise. <coughs> by which, um, from the mix design data. A possible rise in temperature can be calculated roughly. Measuring the temperature rise is not a very difficult task. No, so not, I'm, madam. I'm not talking about measuring. I'm talking about estimating. Yeah, estimating. Now suppose suppose yeah. I have to go for a mass concrete, and I have certain mix design, and I want to know whether the temperature will pass. Yeah, estimation, degrees. estimation. Uh -huh. So estimation. so that estimation is possible from the mix design. Yes. Yes. So for mass concrete, the designer may ask for uh, that mm -hmm. on the uh, concrete supplier that given this size of uh, concrete, what will be the uh, maximum uh, estimated temperature for proposed mix design? That data can be uh, warranted. Madam, when we had a discussion last time, you were talking about shrinkage and you wanted structural engineers to understand shrinkage very well. Can you elaborate on that? Okay. You wanted to say something more about shrinkage probably. Me? Madam. No, no, it is my number. Madam. Madam. Shrinkage is a great problem for the retaining wall for the these thing basements. Where we provide some temperature reinforcement and we assume that uh, cracks will not appear, but concrete doesn't behave like what the designers want. <laughs> it behaves differently. Yes, ma'am. Really, you know. Uh... Shrinkages are going to be of uh, four or five different types: uh, drying shrinkage, 
uh, which is typically for the hardened concrete uh, drying shrinkage, uh, you would see the mostly after seven days or so. The plastic shrinkage occurring in the first 24 to 48 hours. A transmittal shrinkage is, uh, uh, you know, because of, because of chemical and cell desiccation. Uh, typically, autogenous is what happens in uh, reduced uh, water cement ratios, less than 0 0.3 to water cement ratios. You might see autogenous shrinkage is happening, uh, but uh, autogenous shrinkage many a times get controlled. Um, if we have um, slightly higher size aggregates, so if you have even 12 mm size aggregate, 12.5 mm, um, autogenous shrinkage effects are typically do get reduced because of some amount of um, uh, aggregate uh, presence in it itself. Thermal shrinkage again is change in length to temperature changes obviously. Um, and carbonation shrinkage that is typically seen um, after many, um, after much of uh, exposure to the environment, um, typically the hydrated cement is reacting with the carbon dioxide increasing the, uh, in the base, the uh, base content at a very micro level. But what happens is carbonation shrinkage, uh, measuring carbonation shrinkage in a, in a structure which is already in service and saying defining it as carbonation shrinkage becomes a little difficult. The first four types of shrinkages are what we will uh, typically see um, in concrete structure, especially in the initial ages, which is about, like I said, 24 to 48 hours um, to about uh, three months or so also. Autogenous shrinkage uh, are going to happen somewhere between uh, seven to 28 days. Uh, plastic in the very fresh stages of the thing. Drying shrinkage uh, uh, can happen between uh, four, six, four, five days, 28 days, till the concrete is getting uh, hardened. And drying shrinkage many a times continues over a period of time. So it fills the shrinkage, then eventually leading to uh, deeper cracking uh, of the concrete in itself. Um, now yeah, it can be through, through cracks also. For yes, slabs, yes, thin yes. slabs, they are through yes, cracks. Yes, yes. What happens is typically drying shrinkage, you know, the through cracks happen because of the uh, uh, the tensile strength not developing quickly um, uh, uh, as the shrinkage is um, increasing. So the uh, uh, shrinkage stresses are higher than the tensile strength of the concrete or the um, improvement in the strength as the concrete is, <coughs> is not happening as the at the rate at which drying shrinkage is progressing. This leads to typically the cracks being through and through. Um, and drying shrinkage cracks when you have slabs <coughs> Uh, pavements, uh, you know, uh, you will uh, observe there'll be a, a drying shrinkage that happens right through the uh, middle of the slab in itself. Um, it's somewhat like, you know, uh, when you pull a piece of paper uh, from uh, in both hands, it, it tears on the middle portion. That's some, some of the stress development is something similar to that. Uh, is typically uh, 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 pri primarily because of evaporation of water. So plastic shrinkage can be uh, reduced in the initial stages by ensuring curing is done properly, uh, uh, amount of water present for the hydration purpose. And that's what I was talking about earlier, that the moisture content of the aggregates, the uh, absorbed capacity of the aggregates should be actually calculated because that is going to affect the plastic shrinkage of the concrete most of the times because there is less water available for the con uh, cement to hydrate uh, because of these different aspects. It could be temperature, evaporation, uh, curing or starting on time or uh, aggregate absorbing more water. Madam, if you can add some figures to this slide that we can sort of a, uh, use as a guideline you had talked I will, about uh, if you have the email ids of everyone i'll i'll make one and i'll send it I, I ah, correct so I, I don't have it in this tentative huh, right you can send it after a tentative period in which it is going to happen yeah, then sure, what what could be the width the range of the width of the I'll shrinkage crack and when we should be worried because you know shrinkage phenomena not being understood very well at least by client or site people, they feel it is a it is some serious problem. Yes, so when it is serious yes, and when it is not, 
Yeah. And how to take care because you know one cracking of the cracking and cracking and concrete can be another uh, topic that you know. Ultimately, so, if we do everything well, still there is a yes. crack. In that case, anyhow, we have to see to it that those cracks are covered, or uh, we can say closed. So, what to do that? So, if you can add one or yeah. two slide and send it to I'll, me. I'll do that. I'll do that. We can circulate with all. I somebody sent me, I think over here. Um, hmm. It says, uh, send me on a private uh, this. I have only sent you three mails earlier. They were like, you know, what is the outer See, limit of. To test for the compressive test of concrete for a particular mix design. You said that it requires three cubes to be casted and the average value should be considered. Please, ma'am, in case one of the three values do not follow the 0.85 to 1.15 FC, can we just find the average of the other two or do we have to cast another cube? No, so the you test the three value, uh, cubes and if we find the average. Once we find the average, then we, uh, that uh, the uh, test tested cube value has to be between 0.85 to 1.15 of the average value. And if it is not, and if two are, then it is okay. To make, it is still acceptable. You can take the uh, average of the two that are falling within the criteria. You don't need to cast another cube for it. But yes, if more than one is not acceptable, that is not falling within the criteria of 0 0.85 to 1.5 uh, FC, then it is to be rejected. Fine, I think there are no more questions as such. Uh, we shall, yeah. we can, can close here. Uh, I answer you. Thank you very have much. Closing remarks? Or? Uh, basically, I would like to thank uh, Yogini, madam. Thanks for the nice lecture. Some of the slides are quite well prepared, easy for remembering, easy for comparison. Some of the new questions which have come to mind, we'll send you by mail. Sure. The questions which were sent to you by three or four different engineers, most of the questions were covering basics. So that, uh, it means that they should undergo a small or quick course of a mixed design and then ask the question. But the issue which was raised by Parulika regarding accepting the or approving the different mixes, maybe if we take seven eight cases, especially where it can be rejected, that is a matter of study, that it is rejected and why it is rejected. So probably we can do that as an exercise. Madam, thank you very much for uh, finding time from your busy schedule and so, no. explaining the basics in a very simple and lucid language. So we'll close. Yeah. Okay. Thank, you. Yeah. thank you. Thank you. Thank you.